Welcome everybody to the Community College uh, Consortium uh, for Open Educational Resources webinar on measuring the impact of open education. My name is Matthew Bloom. I'm um, one of the professional development team for um, CCC OER, and I am very excited to have a panel of uh, folks today here to talk about this topic, which I think is kind of a hot topic, uh, has been for a while. So um, we'll get into um, the discussion. Um, I want to let everybody know, first of all, to uh, go ahead and um, introduce yourself in the chat so that we can, you know, kind of get a sense of all who's, you know, who's here. And we have quite a few people um, have, who have already logged in. So that's really fantastic. First, though, I just want to real quickly run through the agenda. I'm going to do a real brief overview of what CCC OER is, um, and then we will introduce our panelists and have a discussion. Um, the Q&A section at the end, actually, I want to just let everybody know as participants, we will have time at the end where you'll be able to ask questions. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat, and we might address those as we go. Um, also, at the end, we are going to be asking the audience if they have any particular strategies or approaches that they're using to collect um, in, uh, to collect data and to try to measure impact beyond cost savings. Um, and because, you know, one of the things that we all probably can agree on is that we don't have the answers. And so this is really a great opportunity for us to come together and try to, you know, talk through some different strategies and, and share some ideas about how we can um, look at the impact that open education is having with our students and at our institutions and even beyond our institutions. So um, without you know, further ado, uh, the CCC OER mission, it's a, a nonprofit organization that is committed to expanding awareness and access to open educational resources, high quality, especially um, supporting faculty choice and development, fostering regional OER leadership and improving student equity and success. And one of the ways that we try to do that is by providing these kinds of webinars, these professional development opportunities for the public, not just for our members. Um, our members are, we have quite a few members. And actually, as you can see, we're all over the United States and even a little bit beyond that Northern border there. Um, we, um, the, the CCOER is a, um, is a kind of like the North American node um, of the Open Education Global organization, um, which has a variety of different projects that are, uh, you know, uh, initiatives and, and nodes across the world. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind as well. So um, I just want to go ahead and move right into this. I'm going to try to, I have some questions that I'm going to ask. I've shared them in advance with the panelists and we've discussed a little bit of how we're going to do this. Um, I'm going to try to stay out of the conversation as much as possible, just maybe kind of help guide it along because we really want to hear um, from the um, from the experts on this. We have Ryan Korsting here um, and Michael Lamagna and Rebecca Ortiz. And I want to go ahead and just let each one of them take a couple minutes to introduce themselves and provide a little bit of background or context as to uh, their experience with uh, measuring impact of OER. So Ryan, if you want to go first. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, my name is Ryan Korsange. I'm a director of academic affairs currently at the Tennessee Higher Education Commission. Uh, and so what I do here, a number of things, but I manage textbook affordability initiatives across the state. Uh, so as, as we'll continue to talk about this conversation of measuring the impact of OER, uh, you know, I'm thinking specifically right now about measuring the impact and communicating the impact of OER to folks who sort of aren't normally on campus and who aren't normally um, thinking about higher ed in the same terms that we're thinking about uh, higher ed. Uh, so uh, hopefully that will add some interesting um, components to the conversation. Before I was at the uh, Higher Education Commission here, uh, I was a faculty member at Middle Tennessee State University. I did that for about a decade. And I, in that time, I moved from you know, OER adopter in my class to faculty advocate to managing a program of OER adoption and training and uh, did a lot of data um, uh, impact measuring uh, you know, through that, uh, starting with the real simple how much cost are we saving students? And then moving on to some more complex uh, measurements that I'm sure we'll get into uh, as we talk today. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Michael, do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself? Sure, good afternoon. I'm Michael Lamagna. I'm the Information Literacy Program and Library Services Coordinator and a professor of Library Services at Delaware County Community College in Southeastern Pennsylvania. Uh, I've led my institution's all text committee and our OER initiative for many years and looking at ways to uh, you know, bring an adoption of open textbooks and OERs into the classroom through grant-funded projects, as well as funded initiatives uh, institutionally. 
Uh, recently, I served on an advisory and review board for a statewide grant program that encouraged and supported faculty and academic staff uh, to create, adapt, and adopt uh, open educational resources and zero course materials in the state of Pennsylvania for higher education institutions. And I'm currently on the executive committee for CCC OER, and I'm chairing the research and impact committee here. I've spent many years measuring uh, the impact of OER at my own institution through grant programs. Uh, and I always like to have a discussion about uh, the data that's required internally and externally and how that can inform any decisions that we'll make. And I'm hopefully we'll bring that perspective to our conversation today. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Rebecca? Hello, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to join the space. Uh, my name is Rebecca Vasquez Ortiz, and I am uh, originally trained as a developmental psychologist with the emphasis in uh, multiculturalism and data analysis. I know that's kind of an interesting match, but um, I started my journey in higher education um, as the daughter of uh, an illiterate mother and, and grandmother. And so it's so exciting for me to be um, contributing uh, in spaces where typically you don't see people like me. Um, I uh, am very interested in um, affordable processes for uh, those entering higher education, as well as community empowerment models that center cultural wealth. Um, aside from those areas, I am a proud member and advisor for Arlo, the Regional Leaders of Open Education, and I hold um, at my core a passion for both open pedagogy and dual enrollment. Thank you again, and I, I look forward to the, our conversations. Great. Well, okay, so I guess we can just go ahead and get started here. Um, you know, the, the kind of the premise of this of this webinar today is that, you know, there is has been this movement, not necessarily away from calculating cost savings or focusing on cost savings, but at least expanding um, the focus of it, the measurement of OER impact. So my question is, you know, what brought about this desire to shift away from just gauging cost savings as a measurement of the impact of open education? I um, mean, I think maybe we can also kind of address the, um, you know, the role that cost savings still plays. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm just wondering what, from your perspectives, really has brought about this shift? Uh, so I guess I'll start. Um, from my perspective, I think that the cost savings as a measure was always a limited measure, and it was it had a lot of short term uh, vibrancy. Uh, but but OER users and adopters always knew that there was more to OER than just saving students money. Uh, and so what has happened, I think, is that as more, as OER has expanded, as people start using the materials in their classes, students and faculty alike start to see different value of OER. Uh, and then really get into the position of being able to communicate the value in different ways. So that's one sort of phase that, that indicates the shift away from cost only or cost savings only. The other is, uh, you know, publishers have changed their cost model. So that in, a, in a lot of ways, you, you might could say that they've stole some of the talking points from the old OER movement and they've, uh, you know, it's not five years ago when costs when we were talking about fifteen hundred dollars a semester. We're now talking about four or three hundred dollars a semester for students, and so it's by necessity shifted the cost conversation, uh, and we've had to think about the value of OER past just cost savings. Um, yeah, so so maybe that's where I'll leave things and let the other panelists jump in there. Yeah, I think we can all agree that cost savings is an important metric for measuring the impact of you know, open content adoption at our institutions, given our, our student populations at community colleges. Uh, and, and like Ryan was saying, I think it, it provided a good splash, a good way of gathering people's attention. Look at all this money we can save our students through OER adoption. But we know that that's not the only issue at play here. So the financial barrier that many of our students confront, you know, is, is all too real and requires that we continue to measure cost savings because it becomes an access issue. Uh, but really, as we see greater adoption to, to open content, it's time to look at other metrics such as academic success uh, and, and the role that open access course material plays in that uh, and, and really gather a fuller picture of really the overall impact 
for students' academic experience. You know, and so we, we have to start thinking about other metrics that we can use, uh, thinking about student performance and academic success in the classroom, impact on issues of retention and completion. That is always a big issue for us at community colleges, looking at quality of material, um, thinking about diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, uh, thinking about sense of belonging uh, and, and how students actually will see themselves in the course material and, and looking at issues of teaching and learning practice. So I think all of this really will provide a better picture, a better overall picture of the impact that OER has on our students and at our institution. And so while cost will always be an important measure, I don't think it's the only one, uh, especially as we're trying to bring more people on board uh, for this kind of initiative. Thank you, Michael, for uh, leading us into that, that area of the discussion. And I wanted to add um, that um, although, uh, of course, we all uh, want to make um, uh, education more affordable for students and, and free up um, vital resources for um, basic needs, um, the idea of of low cost or, or saving money really is arbitrary, um, especially as we look um, across the state that I'm from, which is California, um, given that the central area or the central valley of California is occupied um, by uh, agricultural workers, as well as um, various tribal nations across the state. So if we look to cost savings um, and we put price tags, um, th those price tags may be irrelevant for those who, you know, don't have access to clean water, right, or safe soil. So um, an important point in looking at open pedagogy helps us step beyond that model of economics that disproportionately impacts students of color and others marginalized and allows us to step into spaces that allow for the community creation of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge. And so as we look beyond cost savings to um, uh, content in pedagogy and invite um, community members from the broader community, as well as from our student um, population and, and faculty in, we can begin to kind of unpack some of the disproportionate data that we see continuing to plague um, our most marginalized students. And so, uh, again, for me, um, cost is absolutely relevant, but the need to take a deeper dive into what it means to provide um, education and critical thinking um, content to all students is really imperative. And to measure that um, through data analysis and disaggregation of data is uh, even more so um, important as we start to move and, and look for, for uh, ways to uh, truly engage um, those who have been silenced or, or marginalized. Yes, thank you very much. I think that, um, you know, this, I, I appreciate the comments in the chat about the both and approach to this, you know, we certainly do, you know, we, we have we very consciously made the decision that, you know, we, we didn't want to approach this as, you know, you know, cost savings isn't important, because clearly it can be and, and it is in many situations, um, and continues to be so that's uh, really great. And, and some of the, um, some of what you were just talking about, Rebecca, when it comes to looking at the community creation of knowledge and, and the, the role that open pedagogy plays in that and trying to measure that. Um, we definitely want to get, uh, uh, we have a chunk of time later on where we'll focus on that. I just wanted to focus one more question that is related to the, the shift away from cost savings, and that's specifically on the institutional initiatives that we have going right now. Um, a lot of them may have been initially kind of founded on the idea of saving students money and full transparency. I'm I did I introduced myself by name, but I didn't say where I'm at. I'm at the Maricopa Community College District, um, and the Maricopa Millions Project that started back in 2013 was called that because they they wanted to save students literally millions of dollars, five million dollars in five years, and um, they were you know it was successful and it moved on. But it was after a period of time we realized that you know we wanted to do other things. So enough about me. The point is is that what kind of impact does this have on your institutional initiatives if you are making this transition where you're saying okay we're not just going to focus on cost savings anymore we're going to look at all this other stuff are there are there drawbacks to that or are there like is there a positive side to that or it's a mix of things what are your thoughts about that well, well I, I guess i would say you know like 
funding has requirements. And so if we have these initiatives that are funded uh, on the assumption that we're saving money for students and we're marking the money that we're saving, we have to honor those agreements. I mean, that's just like a starting point. Uh, but also we can do more than that. And so certainly leaning into the um, non-monetary value or non-cost savings value and, and measuring that in, of open and OER initiatives is valuable. I think, I think what it, what it um, points to is a different future for the open movement and potentially an exciting uh, and really interesting future for the open movement. Not, not that the, the current future is bad, but it points to new vistas that we can sort of get into where we're talking about things that we all understand to be critically important, the quality of learning, the quality of materials, uh, the stuff that happens in the classroom. Rebecca mentioned pedagogy earlier, right? Like that's where this all goes. Uh, so that we can get to vital learning, quality learning that's truly transformative for students that for all students, uh, you know, and and that's where we get by moving past just measuring cost savings, I think. I, I, I'd like to chime in on uh, and add on to what Ryan said and, and appreciate the that perspective on moving beyond cost savings and and uh, and I, I think recenter something that I brought up briefly in in what I was saying earlier, which is more of an economics based approach or analysis. And so um, for for my institution, as well as others, um, it, it's almost become a bit of a predatory practice of publishers coming in to um, you know, present uh, uh, low cost or no cost, or, or, uh, you know, originally to set set us up for kind of buying into, you know, the business model. And so um, I think that uh, keeping that in mind, especially as we're able to um, bring in uh, more uh, faculty and administrators and classified staff into the process of creating open pedagogy is particularly important in that, um, not everybody realizes when they get trapped into one of these types of publishing types of schemes. And so um, uh, for me, I think that means institutionally, as well as at a broader level, um, we have to establish this understanding of going beyond that so that as people might get pulled in to the idea of low cost or zero cost at the beginning, and then later it becomes a bit predatory, um, we, can, we can help kind of shift uh, uh, people's energies away from that and focus on um, content that really is um, helping to empower students. I couldn't agree more with that comment. I, I think one of the important things we need to consider, especially if we look at issues of adoption at our own institutions, is that there is a benefit to focusing on cost savings, right? Uh, external funding, state legislatures probably are interested in seeing that but it may not connect with every faculty member. So if we're truly looking for adoption across the board, we have to speak to faculty members who will be adopting those course materials. And Rebecca, I couldn't agree more. You have these traditional publishers coming in with these new models. And that speaks to a lot of faculty members because they're seeing the ancillary course materials that are included in that package. And they're seeing that value there for not only them as instructors, but for their students. And so we need to shift that conversation away from just cost savings or what the publishers can and cannot do with you, for you as an instructor and really look at those other issues, right? And so think about what is the strategic initiatives at the institution, how does this tie in and really trying to speak to faculty in terms that they'll understand. So making that connection about, you know, the, the quality of the material that's being adopted uh, because that's always one of those uh, sticking points for a lot of faculty when they're looking at adopting it large scale, talking about student performance and acad academic success in the classroom, and really having that data ready to have that conversation, to talk about its impact on teaching and learning practices, uh, even this move to, to enhanced and, and more remote learning. How does this fit into that course, uh, that learning management system? How does it easily fit into that course. Speaking with faculty administrators, issues of retention and completion. How do we retain our, our students to ensure that they're registering for additional classes? How do we ensure those students are going to complete their program? And so being able to tie in the adoption of open content and how that facilitates retention, how that facilitates completion is so important. 
And so these are major questions that we need to ask ourselves when discussing what kind of metrics we're going to use, what kind of how we're going to measure this impact. And really, it, it requires that we consider the data that we need internally for these conversations, as well as externally, because I still think there is a value to cost savings uh, for a lot of external uh, constituents and stakeholders. I know in the, own, the, the statewide grant opportunity I was involved in, that was a major draw to talk to the legislature to say, here's the cost savings across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. But that doesn't necessarily speak to our faculty who are looking at these other things. So we have to make sure that we're addressing them. Yeah, if I could jump in there, I think that Michael makes a lot of really good points. Uh, one thing I wanted to add uh, is that it seems to me that when we're thinking about the Im impact of OER, the impact looks different in different communities or groups or whatever. So when we think about students, the impact on students, there is a big uh, uh, cost savings impact on them, but also hopefully they also they get uh, access to the materials on the first day, they get some flexibility with the materials, uh, and hopefully if the materials are done well, it transforms and provides different opportunities for learning. That's a really different set of outcomes or impacts than there is for faculty. Uh, I remember sort of the first semester that I moved towards uh, using an OER book in the classes that I was teaching. I moved from a publishing a publisher's book that had uh, test banks and PowerPoints and all the ancillary materials with it. So there was an additional cost for me in terms of my labor. I had to recreate stuff. I had to think through things, but the benefit, what I got out of it that I wouldn't have known on the front end, the benefit was I was more connected to the content, uh, thinking about how it could be taught and how students were learning it. Uh, and so it, it really allowed over that semester, it became a different instructor. And I thought differently about what was happening in class, how students were using those course materials. Uh, and then I had better relationships with the students, which was completely invaluable at that time. That's a different set of impacts and factors than you even get to when you think about campus administrators who are looking, as Michael's mentioned several times, who are looking at retention, uh, who are looking at persistence, who are looking at course completion, uh, those factors, and that's a different set of metrics entirely uh, from people at a statewide level or at a legislative level who are looking at different factors. So I guess the point that I wanted to make here to sum it all together is the data that we collect can be used to tell sort of multiple stories about the impact of OER because it is a rich impact. Uh, it, there is a lot to the impact of it. So we can tell multiple stories with the same set of data. Cost is part but it's not the only part. Well, I wanna say thank you very much. This is going pretty well so far. We see the chat has really um, been pretty active recently. I wanted to read Paul's um, comments as cost savings go well beyond student textbook savings. I wish the cost savings conversation shifted to a bigger picture, including additional student factors beyond textbooks, cost savings to the institution and to the government. Rather than moving on from cost savings, it might be better to take a more holistic and comprehensive approach to cost savings. Um, I think that's a that's a really good, great comment. I think one of the things that um, uh, one of the resources that we had looked at um, was the uh, Midwestern Higher Education Compact's um, uh, resource on uh, returning uh, return on investment when it comes to open education initiatives. And so um, that might be a tool. I'll put a link in there later if I don't have it handy right now. But um, that is something that, that might be worth looking at. But I think that that's a really great um, approach. And I'm wondering if anyone on the panel has any thoughts about, uh, about that idea of looking at kind of like uh, not just the cost savings of the textbooks, but like still thinking about cost savings, but more broadly. Yeah, I guess I'll jump in first on that. I, I mean, my thought is it seems to me that we need to think about costs that are monetary and non-monetary in a holistic picture. And, and there is cost saving that goes past the students, uh, you know, cost on the textbook. There is revenue that's uh, recouped because the data indicates that students who use OER in classes take more classes or enroll in more classes per semester or continue in their uh, path a little bit farther than other students. Uh, so there are revenue gains, but I think that it's important that we catalog the costs clearly, um, right? So we have, as I mentioned, faculty have different work 
uh, associated with using OER sometimes. And sometimes, you know, I was able to make it work because I had a, a three course assignment and an administrative reassigned time. If I was teaching five classes or if I was adjuncting and teaching nine classes between three institutions, it might have been a different um, factor entirely and the work might have been impossible uh, or the cost benefit analysis might not have uh, worked out in the same way. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's valuable to think about the costs holistically and see where that gets us. Uh, I also think it's important to think about the benefits holistically because the benefits go uh, well beyond the use of instructional materials. If you think about our current system, we have expiring access to limited term subscriptions to, to instructional materials, and that's not the best for faculty or that has a cost for faculty and students and administrators alike. Uh, and I think it's important to catalog all that stuff. You know, I wanted to chime in, um, Ryan, uh, uh, um, on, on some of what you were um, kind of alluding to, at least that I felt is that um, and, and that Paul brought up in the in the chat around um, considering a, a broader perspective on what cost savings actually is, and and you know as a at my, from my own personal experience as a student who um, received full financial aid as an undergrad and a graduate student, um, uh, of course I always appreciated free textbooks, but some of the initiatives, and I think we've already uh, made mention to this both in the chat as well um, as in in the panel space, is that. Um, uh, some of those those are built into um, tuition, right? So even though we say, oh, we're we're saving students this amount or or or, or that, and believe me, I have also um, you know put out that information when when I save students, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. But it, it, as we look at at again our most vulnerable students, um, those those debts that students um, acquire in the process of oftentimes just getting a, a, a career certificate or an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree follow them for their entire lives. So when we build those types of practices into uh, financial aid that students oftentimes have to carry, right, the burden of what appear to be free textbooks actually go on to follow people in terms of their credit, their buying ability later. And so I really appreciated Paul's comment on the idea of really looking at what it means to save students money, um, because uh, just the idea of, of leaving higher ed with its incredible debt that has kind of been also covering the costs of instructional material and instruction is, it, you know, is highly problematic. And we even see the federal government trying to approach an understanding of that. So I just wanted people to reflect a bit on what it means to appear free, but yet carry an incredible financial burden. And let's think about how we access these open materials, right? Uh, there, there's going to be a cost there uh, in terms of technology in many cases. And so if we think about our student populations, there are always issues of reliable internet access in the home, uh, issues of uh, device access. You know, many, many students and I could speak personally, I know are taking classes on their, their smartphone instead of on a traditional laptop or desktop. And that creates some challenges. Uh, and also thinking about uh, issues of access to resources at the start of the semester versus a couple weeks in. So if we think about that financial aid distribution that often happens, it's not necessarily at the, the beginning of the semester, but a few weeks in. And so if students are, are, are dependent on that federal financial aid to pay for course material, uh, they're not going to have it when they need it. And that's at the beginning. And and we've all seen those studies that talk about that, right? The importance of students having access to this material. So I think there's a number of different ways we can look at the cost. Uh, and and I, I think it's a very important way to, to examine this. Uh, and I also think we have to think about the other metrics we need to use so that we can speak effectively to all the different constituencies, both internally and externally, to ensure that we're getting the maximum buy-in. 
Well, I'd like to jump in right there because you, uh, you, you pretty much prompted the next question, which is what metrics might we consider? We've already been talking about this a little bit anyway. I mean, we got ahead of ourselves quite a bit, but that's fine because that's really the, the core of this conversation really is, is what is it that we should maybe consider focusing on and how do we go about doing that? Now, that's a really, really broad question, I understand. So I have um, at least 15 minutes dedicated to this discussion here. So um, if you want to go ahead and just uh, jump in there with any thoughts, um, we, there's a lot of different ways that we could approach that question, but what should we be looking at? You know, for me, I talked about it already. We have to consider internal and external stakeholders, what kind of uh, data we need to speak with each of those groups, uh, whether it's a, a state agency, a grant or funding agency, we have to consider what, what they're looking for there. Uh, think about internally, are we talking to administrators? Are we talking to faculty? Are we talking to staff? Externally, as we think about the community that's part of community college, thinking about our students and their families, how do we speak to them about this? And so it, it's going to require that we really stop for a minute and think about what data we need to collect and more importantly, why we're collecting this data. What story does it allow us to tell? You know, for me, I'm looking at it from a pragmatic standpoint of uh, a community college and really it's, it's that student performance. Uh, academic success issues, issues of retention and completion, you know, quality of materials, looking at, you know, open edu uh, open uh, pedagogy uh, and professional development that's related there. And, and so uh, as we're thinking about this data, it's not just going to be that traditional data, the quantitative data. We have to also think about the qualitative data so our students are able to tell their story. If we think about, you know, uh, a sense of belonging, uh, how, how the course material reflects our student populations. So that qualitative data, that focus group. We also have to think about the methodologies that we're going to use when we collect this data uh, to, to make sure that we're able to, to have a reliable data set to speak from. Uh, you know, this is a conversation that I've been having recently about course marking. So how do we ensure that we're getting the most out of our data sets? Uh, you know, so are, do institutions mark their courses? Does it allow for easy quantitative data to be pulled out of our, our systems? And, and that's where I'd, I'd kind of start that conversation is really thinking about what data we're going to collect and why we're going to collect it and what story that's going to allow us to tell in, in terms of those different areas. Uh, so let, let me add some thoughts. Um, so I think that what we need is we need a set of metrics that allow us to talk about student learning in the classroom. Uh, and what is challenging is that we have a lot of proxy measurements for student learning, GPA, course completion rate, persistence, right? These allow us to sort of talk around learning, but don't always uh, equal learning. Uh, and so what I think we need to do is think creatively about how to represent student learning that happens in the classroom uh, in open classrooms. Uh, we need to think about different ways of representing those uh, and using the, that data uh, to talk about the impact of open. And so what that I think means is a lot of qualitative stuff. Uh, so we want maybe we can talk to faculty members a little bit about um, the, the pedagogical moves that they're allowed to make because of open resources that they wouldn't be allowed to make without open resources. Or we can talk to students about the, um, the, the way they find themselves and find their learning in open resources that they haven't experienced using non-open resources. Uh, or we could talk about the different types of resources that can be used in classes that are using open resources versus the ones that are using standard published resources, right? Because I think what we what we have the opportunity to figure out, and I don't have all the answers here, I'm not sure that anybody does, I, I hope that somebody here does, to be clear, but I think what we have the opportunity to figure out is a different way of cataloging um, and measuring student learning that happens in the classroom, because at the end of the day, I think that what we're actually concerned about is learning. Uh, for all students and for every student and quality learning that impacts their life for, for a long time to come. And so that's the set of metrics that I think is the most intriguing to me. Yeah, we, we can talk about some of the, 
there's some quantitative metrics we can use to sort of get around and triangulate towards that. But I'm most interested in the, those rich learning centered metrics uh, that require a little bit more messy, complicated quantitative data. And Ryan, I think that brings up a great point about cost, right? Because that kind of data collection is going to have a cost to it. That that the, the simple quantitative collection, you're, you're running a report in your system. Uh, hopefully, it's set up well so you can it's auto generated. Uh, that qualitative is going to require a lot of work and, and a lot of effort on the institution to not only identify study participants, whether it's students, faculty, community members, but then to actually go through and and perform that focus group that interview so that, that would be another area that we we probably should discuss when we think about that kind of that methodology yeah yeah and let me add another layer to that i mean i think that there has to be some conversation of defining what we're measuring in each of these things and i'll give you an example and it doesn't talk to the the qualitative thing entirely but uh i've been a part of a lot of conversations about what the heck we even mean by oer uh, do we mean course materials that cost less than a certain threshold, or do we mean course materials that are openly licensed? And those are two really different things, but if campuses, you know, I'm thinking across the state, if I have different campuses who are defining OER in different ways, and they're telling me a use rate, or this class uses OER and this one doesn't, but they're defining OER differently. We got a problem and the data is not saying what we think it says. Uh, and so if we start to think through a lot of these terms that we use, finding agreement, defining them carefully, defining them precisely, understanding what we're talking about, especially when we move outside of an individual classroom or an individual program to, to a campus or a state system or, or beyond, right? Those, the issues of definition become really difficult uh, and important, uh, but also potentially add to that cost that you're talking about. You know, uh, I wanted to um, reflect for a moment on, uh, I think something came up in the chat, but I, I, it's tough for me to keep up with the chat because there's such inc incredible comments being made there. So um, I hope that I can get a copy of the chat later, but that's a side note, right? Um, uh, I, just, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, as as we're looking about moving more towards open pedagogy and and kind of I mean in a radical sense is which I tend to bring is the idea of a kind of an outdated textbook right and so um, when I look at this uh, kind of approach of saying you know what what metrics can we use and for me it's centered on students and and that centering says what what are students saying what are students doing um, because um, I'm a developmentalist, and so uh, I see my students already creating content. You know, they're content creators. They're doing it all over the place in social media. And it wasn't too long ago that we were frowning on social media and we were frowning on um, uh, the different sites that we thought were less rigorous and, and, and less scientific. And now we see students running wild with content creation. And when I bring students into my courses and invite them to create content, whether that's video content or written content or assessment. Can you imagine students creating their own assessments? Um, it, it, that really, for me, creates this communal type of um, co um, social construction of knowledge and learning and ownership. And I think as a statistician that we could still look at those things via uh, quantitative analysis. So oftentimes I think we 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 kind of um, shift over to the idea that we need to use qualitative um, data. And, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't because absolutely qualitative data is so rich and it forms the basis of multicultural psychology. But I also think that there are proxy variables and mediating variables and path analysis models that could help us um, understand some of the intermediary processes that go on between the creation of knowledge, the consumption of that knowledge, and the ability to take that knowledge into the broader sphere. Uh, and what I consider the broader sphere is the community and family. So if we're able to look at metrics that say, um, this content creation allowed students to not only consume 
and, and create, but it also impacted their immediate siblings, cousins, uh, communities, neighbors, that those metrics are, are as important, um, especially as we're looking to increase enrollment across higher education. Yes, thank you, Rebecca, for that. And I, I was just noting in the chat that um, it connected to what you were just saying, but also what you were saying earlier is, is more about this, the kind of involvement of the, the impact that open education can have on the broader community. And um, I was just wondering, like, you know, what you what you think, um, you know, we should be looking at there in terms of open pedagogy and that kind of community uh, generation of knowledge, like how, how do we, how would we go about measuring that? Maybe not, I, I don't know, other panelists can feel free to chime in as well and people in the chat too, but I'm just, I kind of, I'm wondering like what that would look like, you know, how do we go about doing it? I mean, I would suggest um, that we look at um, a sense of efficacy among our students who matriculate through programs um, that center open pedagogy and also center OER. So for example, at my campus, we have some degrees that are OER degrees. And that means that there is not one textbook that's purchased, right? But at the same time, we're still making the leap to open practices in terms of creating, in particular, what is interesting to me is assessment, right? Because I am interested in assessing what the students create in terms of assessment. And so um, I would suggest that uh, if there are opportunities to look at that type of data and parse it out around um, the measurement of of student performance, as well as their sense of efficacy over the creation of content. I think that would be really powerful as um, we try to move away from, you know, these old outdated textbook processes, because uh, in the workforce, we're not really seeing people using that type of closed, you know, uh, really um, uh, static knowledge anymore. So we're seeing, um, you know, really the cutting edge um, fields using dynamic processes of learning. And so I think we, we even see some of that going on uh, more in a more prolific sense in K through 12 than we do in higher ed. Um, so I, I would center the idea of um, being able to parse out data that um, involves uh, a sense of, of, of construction. And I think that could be done, uh, especially in courses and with instructors uh, who are allowing the students the freedom to create um, and navigate their own education. Yeah, there is quite a bit of interest in the chat about the idea of um, open education impacting the community more broadly. Um, and I think that, you know, maybe that is a subject for that could be um, its own webinar actually at some point in the future. So um, we'll take a note of that. But of course, we can continue that discussion. Um, I would like, just given the fact that we have, um, we're, we're kind of approaching the last quarter of the webinar here, um, we can maybe like transition into this, the second to last question, um, which is specifically about resources. Now we've already talked. We've we've provided, you know, discussed a lot of different ideas and things like that. Um, but I'm just wondering from the panelists, but then also from from the participants there in the chat, what resources um, are available to help this community guide by community? I mean, the open education community, um, you know, guide further discussions and for further practices and efforts to um, measure these kinds of impacts. So. What resources do we do we think might be out there for folks other than this webinar, apparently, which is which is emerging as potentially one. Sorry, I guess I'll go first. Um, I'm going to try. We'll see how this works to copy a couple of things into the chat. Uh, Okay, that didn't work exactly like I intended. So I'll go back while another panelist is talking and copy actual hyperlinks in there. Uh, but there are a couple of things out there. Uh, Lumen has some stuff in their sort of OER playbook about measuring the impact. Uh, there's the COOP framework, which I think is becoming increasingly popular uh, for thinking about the impact of OER. Um, there's uh, some chapters uh, in some press book books about uh, sort of getting started with OER that are helpful. 
And then the o OERI Student Impact Toolkit has a, ver a variety of resources about uh, helping students measure the impact of OER. These are all things that I think are helpful. Uh, I'm not sure they get us all the way there, but sort of between them, um, they, they get us someplace uh, and help us, uh, at least in my perspective, they help me think about what we ought to be doing that we're not currently doing to think about the value of, or the impact and measuring that impact of OER. So let me get those corrected hyperlinks in the chat. Those are excellent. I, I know um, CCC OER and the Research and Impact Committee is going to be providing some, some resources in the near future. Uh, and really, it's about going into the literature, uh, seeing what studies are being performed, looking at their methodology, thinking about how it applies to your specific campus, your location, your community, and thinking about what data they're collecting, how they're collecting it, and how you could replicate that study to tell the localized story for, for, for your institution and community. And so for me, that's where I would spend my time is really looking in the literature. And Ryan, these are great resources. These are some that I was actually thinking about myself, the OERI uh, and, and Coupa frameworks are excellent resources to start with. I just wanted to, um, uh, chime in on on just local right local efforts and in particular uh, you know again as as a child you know the library was a, was a place where i would often run to although the librarians were always were, were not never uh, ever the nicest people and now that i have jumped into o, o, open pedagogy and oer i have ha i have found an incredible resource in every librarian that I have met across institutions. And so for me, I, I, I always partner up with my librarians because um, they're incredible researchers, right? And, and, and uh, they provide so many different, on my campus, there's so, so much access to different portals around resources. And um, I also wanted to mention that um, uh, the Arlo Network, um, as we're moving forward uh, with uh, our next um, phase is looking to also create spaces around um, establishing uh, uh, resource hubs for um, for those of us around North America. And um, uh, but I would definitely say um, in terms of measurement, uh, there's an incredible uh, alliance uh, if you can establish it both locally at your community college and, and in, with the surrounding universities between the methodologists who happen to be in the field of psychology and also um, the, the librarians who, who really tap into the databases that we have access to um, and are actually very savvy when it comes to data analysis. Well, I want to make sure that we have the opportunity to solicit some um, some feed not feedback, but like you know some participation from the audience here. Um, anyone in the audience who's interested in in you know you can turn on your audio. You could, I believe so. You can turn on your audio, your camera, whatever, to answer this question here. But we're wondering what kind of data you are collecting at your institution, um, why and how you're collecting it, and to whom you're reporting. Um, you know, because as we've kind of talked about that's pretty important right because you have a particular audience so if anyone has any thoughts that they want to chime in with um you know to, to just join the conversation feel free to turn your audio on um or even just pop it in the chat if you're not comfortable doing that but we have a few minutes here dedicated to um to trying to address some of these uh some, some of your approaches so this is esperanza i hope i didn't step on anybody's toes by just unmuting. Uh, I, I won't turn my camera on because I'm on grandma duty right now and the baby's sleeping. So, <laughs> uh, so I've been posting in the chat uh, my thoughts about um, technician education or technical education. Now, I'm at a two year college and the bulk of our degrees are centered around the petrochemical industry and refineries that are in my area. And uh, and in fact, I, I'm speaking from my own experience. I am in training myself to become a solar installation instructor for our new um, clean energy programs that are coming on board. Uh, and I have in front of me the proprietary training guides that we're required to use if you want to be certified in those areas. Um, and yet there, there's a well, I mean, this this stuff isn't like 
um, you know, just so cutting edge and coming out now that people don't know about it. People haven't used it. There's a wealth of information out there. Uh, but the will to, <clears throat> I guess, buck the system and tell these industries um, that, hey, you know, there's a different model we could use to, to train folk in these areas. Uh, they, they don't need to be spending, you know, so much money to, to obtain books that you mandate. Um, you know, for example, if you, if you wanna be uh, a process uh, technician, you have to use the books that the, comp the industry says are like the, the training um, manuals and, you know, the training Bible, so to speak. Uh, and it, it creates a burden on students. And yet you hear industry saying, we have so many jobs that we can't fill. You have a lot of jobs that you can't fill because you're not you're not necessarily using a model that gives everybody equal shot at the at those jobs, right? Um, and so, you know, I mean, I knew about this stuff ahead before, but now I'm really like in it because I'm doing it myself. And so, um, you know, we can create hundreds of open chemistry courses and change the way instructors teach those materials. But many times at two-year colleges, those classes are just support classes to what the students are really there to get. And they, they have no way around using what they're being told they have to use. Yeah, that's something that we've talked uh, some about in Tennessee. Um, and, you know, my experience with OER comes from a four year where we were using sort of more, I guess I would say traditional and not technical um, uh, materials in our classes. Uh, but it strikes me as something that's really interesting and important in Tennessee. There's a huge focus on technical training, uh, but there's a huge expense to the proprietary training materials that you've talked about really well. Uh, I think that also the mechanism for converting to OER is different because uh, technical faculty in Tennessee, they teach differently. So they're in the classroom like from eight until five every day. And that means that they don't really, we can't use the same le uh, levers. We can't use release time. We can't use extra compensation in the same way. Uh, the, the life cycle of OER development on the technical side is just incredibly different. Uh, it's something that I'd like to figure out a lot more. Um, so maybe we can connect offline because it seems like you have some interesting uh, ideas there. I look, I look forward to it. So I've been scrolling through the chat and, and it, it's very interesting to see uh, just, just the range of ways that we're collecting data, how we're collecting data. And one of the big issues that I find today and and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I want to give a shout out to Louise Feldman, my colleague who's here, who's doing a great uh, inventory for our institution for faculty who are using OER. And we're currently walk, walk, working through the process of uh, institutional policy for course marking. So I'm seeing a lot of individuals are working with their registrar's office to, to identify those courses that are using open materials uh, and then running those reports. And it, it, it kind of hits on that quantitative data should be easy, uh, especially if we have our system set up correctly, but in many cases it's not and requires a lot of manual things. So from my perspective, I think a big part of this discussion uh, would be course marking so that we can maximize the use of our internal systems uh, and really quickly and easily pull that data out. Uh, so that, that's just one of those things that I'm, I'm seeing happening in the discussion right now. Uh, and I, I would say, you know, a question I would have is, you know, would it be useful if we had some kind of uh, standardized practice that we can use as a community so that we can benchmark against other institutions? And really, as Ryan was saying earlier, I believe sharing that common language, common definitions, so that we know at one institution, if we say this, it's, it's, it's the same thing at every other institution. Just wanted to see if anybody had any thoughts on that. 
Well, I don't have any thoughts on that, but going back to what Esperanza did put oil, uh, that the proprietary nature of technical manuals and how it is all, well, you know, profit driven to get these people educated, that even stepping into something that is an OER or OER acceptable. I don't think that would ever happen, but changing their mindsets, that can happen. You know, oh, it, before the 2000s, OER really wasn't available, wasn't really out there. You know, it took, <clears throat> it took stuff to happen. So I think making technical the aspect unproprietary that will happen, you know, it's gonna take some time and pushing out there and saying, hey, look, we can do this in regular academic. We should be able to do it here, but we can't because of these roadblocks. Does that make sense? Cause that's kind of like how the OER initiative started. We see this, we need to make steps towards that. Oh, yes, yeah, so was... Susan, um, this is Esperanza. I'll respond real quick. Uh, my, my, my solution to this is that industry needs to be at the table. Yes. They, they need to be part of these conversations. They need to be represented here because that's a big um, hole that needs to be plugged uh, in this whole OER you know, movement and process. Um, well, not so, just yeah, industry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just like I say, you know, even when we're talking about, like, for example, um, training a certain number of graduates and then moving in them into the workforce. Well, if workforce isn't talking to you, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Same thing here. If we want, um, you know, workforce and industry to use open materials and open pedagogy, then they have to be in on the tape. They have to be at the table when decisions are being made. So the uh, you know, that they, they feel valued and they can put their input in and we can work together to make the changes. But if we're just trying to drive it from our side, it's not going to happen. True, true. But sometimes, I mean, but look at how it happened. Um, what was it um, in the 2000s, how OER got started or how um, Creative Commons got started is because something happened in government Somebody said, uh, no, this isn't gonna happen. I mean, this is like, you know, the 70 years plus, my history is a little vague. Um, sorry about that, but it did happen. So I think getting industry to the table, getting big places like CAT and Toyota and um, Lockheed Martin, those things, those people to the table will happen but maybe they also need an invitation too, an incentive to getting them to the table. You, you know, I, I, I know we're nearly out of time and I, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for, for joining in, for allowing me to speak, but I also um, saw one particular comment. Um, and like I said, I need to go through them more in depth later. And I think it was Yoti, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, is the idea of, um, Oh, sorry, is the idea that uh, we should be looking to students. And I think that I, I've, I've made that point in particular. And I had a quick example of a student who reached out to me and said, can I have access back to all of the things I wrote in my, in my course? Because uh, I want to use it to inform my application to nursing school. And so I just want to throw out there the idea that if you are already in the space of creating um, open um, pedagogy, and we're in the space of utilizing OER, that it's so important to uh, almost form a roster of, of some of your students who are, are contributing at such a high level that you may be able to rely on them as you move forward and bring their voices back to the table. And we're trying to do that at my institution um, with bringing students who have gone on and, and were actively creating content and, and talk um, to others about how empowering that process is. 
Thank you, Rebecca. Well, I want to thank everybody for this uh, fantastic, uh, all the participation at the end here, the great activity in the chat and everything. Um, so I, I actually sent, I put a link in the chat, but you can view all of the far, uh, fall webinars um, at that URL right there. And um, I encourage you to check out like all of the archived webinars that we've, we've done for years. There's I mean, I don't know how many, there's like a hundred of them or something like that that, that, that are out there. Um, so I look, uh, I encourage you to do that. Please, um, if you're not part of the community email and you want to be looped in on, on you know, all things OER, I guess I shouldn't say all, but lots of OER and you want to get extra emails, um, then please join the community email. Uh, you don't have to be a member of CCC OER to do that, but it is really a great, in itself, a great resource, not just for networking communication, but people share things and ask about things on there. So it's really great. Um, and then we have a number of blog posts, EDI blog posts and student OER impact stories on our website. So I encourage you to check that out as well. And please let us know how you think we did. And I encourage you to join us next time and, and uh, see you all later. Thanks for being here. Thank you again to our panelists as well. Thank you. This was a great discussion.